I'm really excited to introduce uh, a good friend to Commerce Next uh, and an amazing leader. Charlie Cole uh, joined FTD as their CEO in March of 2020, um, just as the global pandemic was taking hold and shutting down the world, and about six months after FTD had um, had come out of bankruptcy. So uh, Charlie has a great story to tell about how he led a digital transformation for a 110-year-old brand while navigating uh, lots of uncharted water uh, going through in uh, the workplace that was impacted by the pandemic. So please welcome to the Commerce Next Stage, Charlie Cole. Just realizing that a uh... I put disruptor and transformation in the title of my, ugh, I hate myself a little bit right now. Um, so hi everybody, um, I'm going to tell you a quick story about this slide because I think it's hilarious. Right before I got up on stage, they called me and they're like, hey, we think there's something wrong with your deck because this slide is that ugly. Um, I'm not kidding. They actually thought they didn't download phones or something like that. So Scott, uh, Scott said kind of the story, but the um, company went bankrupt, 111 years old at this point, and uh, you couldn't have possibly prepared me for how screwed up this company was. And I, I think that's the first thing that I learned about bankruptcies is that companies go bankrupt for a reason. And it sounds cliche, but it's true. And I started the first day of national lockdown. So my first day was March 23rd of 2020. So sweet couple of years. Um, but like, I, I want to give you guys this presentation not as like a self-referential victory lap, because I think the learning is like how you fix problems, right? Because a bankruptcy is just a really complex problems. And I thought about this and I thought about what's the best way to think about problems. And I don't know if anybody's here has been to AA. If you have, keep it down. Um, but the first rule is recognize you have a problem. And I realized that that's not just an idiomatic phrase. It's super freaking important. And I would say, if you're gonna solve a problem, the number one thing you have got to be aware of is institutionalization. Let me tell you what I mean by that. If your people are not willing to change, you need to change your people, full stop. And you have to be ruthless about it. And you have to be fast. And I think that that's an area where it sounds callous. It's not. It's super important. And I would say that's true for all of your teams today. Doesn't matter how good you're doing, bad you're doing, if you're not willing to evolve, if you're not willing to change, you're going to eventually lose. And I think for me, this is another thing I couldn't believe. Because when I joined the company, I put out this survey, and basically there was a sort of somewhat elegant way to ask people, what do you think went wrong with bankruptcy? You know my answer I got back? Nothing. Wasn't our fault. Bad luck. Bullshit. <laughs> That's not correct. And so for me, you have to find the people that are going to be transforming with you. And if they're not willing to, you have to make hard decisions and you have to do it really freaking fast. And I would say I probably wasn't a little fast enough in hindsight, but live and learn. And so I pulled this slide up because I thought this is pretty cool. Um, this is from my first board deck. It's the real slide. I didn't edit it at all. And this was kind of my evaluation of the team and kind of my evaluation of the opportunity overall. And it's literally cut and paste from this board deck. And I, I want to just quickly point out the ugly part. Because there's a lot of words in the slide. I don't like wordy slides. But this is basically as bad as it can get. Um, you're going to see this statistic later, but I'll share it with you. It's one of my favorite business statistics in the history of mankind. Net promoter score. I think most of you guys are familiar with net promoter score. Our Floris net promoter score. What Floris thought of us when I joined FTD was negative 88. So not only would 100 people not recommend us, 88 of them would tell them to run the other way. That's how bad it was. And remember, survey, not our fault, right? And so you have to be acutely aware of how you got to this problem, and that's where it starts. And if people are just like, well, then you have to be able to make changes. Um, same deck, okay? Same deck. So this was two months of really smart people, including really smart board members, aligning on what our most important things we have to do are. Two months. And like, one of my board members was the CFO for the HP Compact merger. Like, these are some seriously smart people. And I will tell you now, coming out of this with two years of hindsight, there are too many things on this list. What I wish this slide would have been is maybe two, maybe three. Maybe three things. 
because when you try to solve everything, you solve nothing. And for us, we probably are about six months behind where we should be because we bit off too much too, too soon. And when I look back at it, you just have to ask yourself, what are the key things that you really need to fix to get this thing back on the rails so you can start iterating? Because these are all big swings, right? And you're gonna miss, and you're gonna have scope creep, and you're gonna do all these things. And so when I look back at this, I really wish that maybe the ones that I would want are third bullet, fourth bullet, and fifth bullet. That's it. And then once we did those, the other stuff would come in and go from there. Because for two years, two years, a billion dollar company, I couldn't run A-B tests. That's how screwed up our platform was. So you have to ask yourself, what are the real needle movers? Now, here's the rub. Some of this stuff you just have to do before you can even start making money again. So you're gonna shrink while you're doing this work and that's painful, but that's the kind of prioritization and triage that you need whenever you're trying to solve a problem. Sometimes growth can wait. And then you can start growing once you fix the more systematic stuff. And I think that was a huge learning for me and one that I would highly recommend you guys. If you guys make a list like this, cull it down. Make it smaller, have less bullets, do less things and do them really well and really quickly. So I wanna talk about digital transformation for a second because it is probably the most overused term in our industry and you hear about it all the time. And so one of my favorite things to do is kind of start with the definition of things. And so transform, which I pulled directly from Google here, is make a marked change in the form, nature, or appearance, or I like the, or make a marked change. So look, the key to transformation is knowing when to stop, <laughs> right? Because if you just keep on making marked changes in your business, you're never gonna actually start to grow to the extent you need to, because you're just doing too much. And so the concept of constant transformation, I would argue, is stupid. Because there is a difference between knowing when to transform and knowing when to evolve, right? So think about it, think about some of the biggest brands in the world. How redesigned is the Tesla or the iPhone? Would you argue the iPhone has been transformed in the last six versions? I would argue no, they're evolving it. And so knowing when to stop your transformation and moving on to an evolution is I think another one of those keys and don't get obsessed with the concept. And I think this is where we have this concept, uh, concept and I, I haven't figured out a better way to say it so I just call it participation trophies versus victories. Because this is really hard, right? You have 400 people who are just working their asses off and they're like, hey, we finished the e-commerce replatform. And on one side of my head I go, that's great. And on my one side of my head is, that doesn't matter. Because it's, what matters is how we use it to make more money. That's a participation trophy. I finished an e-commerce replatform. Congratulations, you just made no money. Did you make conversion rate better? Does it run faster? Do we have better organic rankings? Those are victories. So the analogy I would make for you is, I played athletics most of my, uh, my life, never once did a coach congratulate me for working out. But they congratulated me when I hit game-winning shots or won a game, okay? And so this becomes a really big cultural challenge for all of you and your teams because people want to feel appreciated. And the reality is our technology team works their butts off to finish that e-commerce replatform. So you can't just dismiss it. You can't just pretend like it doesn't matter. But at the same time, you have to then say, okay, great. We're past that poll, let's go chase the next one. Because it's this concept of how you maintain a really good culture within your team. And so we would do certain things, like we would recognize events, and then we'd immediately put metrics of success behind it. So in our e-commerce platform, for example, it was site speed, it was organic rankings, it was uh, also kind of our conversion rate. But, we, but it's hard, right, because people wanna feel appreciated, and so you always have to think about this, because as a leader, it gets really easy to just focus on results. And, and, and I think we've all been victim to it at times. But you have to make people feel accomplished, especially when they just had the crap kicked out of them in a bankruptcy. Because if you don't recognize accomplishments, you're gonna lose them. And you'll never get to that place where you are optimizing for conversion rate, because people will leave. Um, we had 130 developers in Hyderabad, India, and they were just on an ice flow, 
Nobody was talking to them. They were completely siloed. I went out and visited them um, in February. And the first thing they said to me was, do you know you're the first CEO that's ever come and visited us? And I stopped, and it actually made me entirely think differently about this visit. I thought I was going to visit, honestly, for the proverbial shake hands and kiss babies, right? Like, just go see myself, do a queen wave, and leave, right? But what I realized is it's a freaking retention tool, me going out there twice a year. It sounds self-referential, but it's true, and we've actually now modeled it. So again, me going to India doesn't accomplish anything. However, if I can improve retention, I save money. So I think you have to be aware of this, and you have to be the gotcha is to go totally type A and to say, all that matters is results. You need to recognize the participation trophy moments occasionally. And it can be a little uncomfortable. Because in your head, you're like, I know this isn't making any money yet. But you have to do it. So I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, diversifying your supply chain. Right? If all you have is your supply chain in China and you make shirts, and you move your supply chain to a combination of China and Vietnam and you make shirts, by definition, you haven't really done anything until you need it, until there's a COVID lockdown in Guangzhou. Then you're gonna actually recognize the victory. But you had to kind of recognize the participation before you get there. I think this is a super important concept for your teams, and I bet you a lot of you type A folks in the room, present company included, is too focused on the victories. And we're not doing a better job recognizing kind of what our people are doing around us to enable those victories. Okay, so what do we actually do? So this is what we did in the last two years. Um, we've entirely blown up the team and, and kind of started over, some by self-selection, um, some by, well, force change. The metric accountability and transparency is the thing that I'm most proud of. Um, the, we do weekly business reviews with about 100 people. We do monthly town halls with the entire company, and there's never a moment where someone in our company does not know what's going on at a metric basis for everything. And I believe that's the only way to manage a business. No more is the weekly business review with the leadership team. I think you have to get past that, and I think you have to kind of do that, because otherwise, why are people gonna follow you for all this change if they don't feel like they understand what the hell's going on? And our data infrastructure's new, our e-commerce platform's new, our new Flores POS solution that we just relaunched, we launched a new Flores website solution that we custom built with Shopify, oh, we have two new rebrands that we launched, and we new stuff to sell, like lots and 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 lots of new stuff to sell, but, Equally important is what we didn't do, okay? And I think this is another area that you have to force yourself to do this exercise and say out loud, this is not what we're going to do right now. And that's hard, because it's kind of an admission of defeat or complacency or apathy or whatever you want to call it. Super important that you do this too. So second bullet kills me that we haven't fixed our ERP yet. Our ERP has been out of license since 1992. But we haven't fixed it yet. You wanna know why? Because we had to get our, our front end on the rails first, and we just kept on doing manual processes in the back end, because it's working good enough. It sucks, okay? I would say of all the people in this room, I probably have the worst, maybe the second worst ERP of all of you here. But it is what it is. We had to pick that battle, because our tech resources were more based on revenue generation than really what fixing an ERP is. It's really kind of labor reduction, right? You automate things, you make things flow better. That can wait. We're doing manual processes right now that make me want to kill somebody, but it is what it is. Um, we did not launch a new vertical yet. So FTD is a network. We've toyed with the idea of going into other areas where we can make a network, like butchers and stuff like that. Haven't done it yet. Um, we haven't gone after international yet. I basically just, I, I've been so focused on the US, I kind of, if you go to our Canadian websites, it's awful. It's one of the worst websites you'll ever see in your life. I bet you when we launch on our new platform, our conversion rate will quintuple. No exaggeration. If you don't believe me, go to ftd.ca. It's awful. Haven't fixed it yet. Um, I really want to change our florist payment structure because it's, back, it's completely backwards, the way they, they work with florists. The industry of kind of the wire services, which is us, 1-800-Flowers, and Teleflora, we're kind of the big three in the space. The industry has designed something that basically incentivizes me to sell more cheap stuff as opposed to sell luxury products. Because we get a percentage of GMV, and I want to optimize conversion rate. Right? So I want to sell a bunch of $40 products. Well, guess what? Flores won't make them. They can't afford to. Gas prices going up, labor shortages, the whole shebang. And so our payment structure has to be fixed. Haven't done it yet. And when Flores asked me this question, hey, when are you going to change this? And I was like, I don't know, like 18 months from now? 
They're like, why? I was like, because this company's really screwed up and I got other stuff I got to do. And so I think that, and we haven't opened any brick and mortar stores. We talked about that too. Point is, really, really bloody important. You decide what you're not going to do. I'll say one more thing for all the people in the C-suite or VP suite in this room. It's really important you communicate this up to the board, up to the CMOs, up to whoever, because then there's no kind of misunderstanding of what we're doing. And I think that's really important. Um, I talked about this, right? I, I, I say, like, when are you going to stop transforming certain things and start evolving? So for example, e-commerce replatform, that's a transformation. A-B testing, that's evolution, right? It needs to become rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, make the site better, rinse, repeat. That's not transformation. You're evolving an existing product. And so it's semantics to some point, right? It's semantics to some point. But um, it's important, and I think you need to communicate it. Like, hey, guys, we're on an evolutionary path now for our marketing because we finished the rebrand, which was a transformation. You'll find it really kind of level sets how people are thinking about stuff. OK, so I had to at least take some numbers to show you how bad it was. So I mentioned the negative 88, customer NPS of 5. Um, that's my favorite. Air ground mix, super important because air is expensive. Uh, so we had to kind of get that better. Our customer service cost per call was high. Our member count was shrinking. Um, and it was, just, it was just awful. I mean, and, and I think overall, this is sort of the piece that I always talk about is probably in the very, very bottom. Our company, at this point, 109 years old, at one point publicly traded, our company had no idea how much money they were making for every order. No idea. We had to build it do it really manually, optimize our website to margin per order, margin per visit, really. Um, and this is where we were, and here's where we are. Um, if it was a nine inning game, I'd say we're probably on inning three or four. But I'll tell you what matters, I'll tell you what matters. Um, what matters is we bought the thing for 105 million, we've dividended out 140 million, and now it's worth 575 million. That's all that really matters, right? That's the victory. These are all the things you have to do to get there. And so, Am I proud of these numbers? Only in the context of the deltas. I know we can go much better. I want to get customer NPS into the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. It's hard, right? Um, what's weird about flowers is uh, it's the most important moments in your life. And so if we screw them up, people are really going to downvote you. And if you do your job right, you're completely invisible. No one has ever received flowers and said, thank you, FTD. They say, thank you, Dara. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, other people who rhyme with era. Um, and so like, I, I think that that's super important, but it's, it's kind of our job. And so member NPS, check that out. Positive figures, four. Am I proud of that number? In the context of the Delta, you bet. Like, it's a long ways to go, right? But we still, we still have to kind of keep going there. And then we're making a lot more money. But I'll tell you, my, one of my other favorite bullets is the bottom one. We're moving more people to India. That is extremely great for the bottom line, and it's extremely great culturally, right? Because they feel like they're a growing part of our business as opposed to an afterthought on an island. And so this is what I think you need to do to drive change. And I tried to generalize this as much as humanly possible. It's important to realize that there's areas of your business right now, even if it's running like a top, that you should probably be changing in a forthright way. So I talked about the first one. Find out who's willing to change. If they can't change, change them. Don't pick too many battles. Focus is so important. And again, it's another one of those idiomatic things that people talk about all the time is focus, focus, focus. So freaking important. And then hold yourself extremely accountable to numbers. We have a rule. No hiding bad news. Own them. Up and down. Everyone in the company. Own your good numbers. Own your bad numbers. People love to celebrate the good stuff they do, and they hate to look at things that aren't going well. I don't quite get it. It's really important we kind of do both. Um, Burnout, man, I was just talking to my friend Andrea before this. Um, I worked like 14 hours a day for two years straight, and it sucked. And I, I'm capable of doing it, but I'm telling you, I'm a much happier person now that I'm not doing that. You have to manage against burnout. I think this is especially important in a remote and hybrid working culture, because you just have nothing else to do. You're home, and so you work your ass off all day. It's not healthy, and you have to actively manage it. I put the word there actively on purpose because it can't be passive. You can't assume people are going to figure this out for themselves. You need to help. You need to actively do it to drive the change you want. I said the high, had bad news things. And then I want to open brick and mortar, right? I want to actually start to, and the reason I put that in there is because I'll generalize it. What you need to do to drive change is identify new pockets of traffic. 
Okay, so it, I put brick and mortar in there, but maybe it's B2B. If your strategy is, I'm gonna win on Google and Facebook, you're probably screwed, right? That'll get you to a point, but you're gonna plateau really bloody quickly. Be ruthlessly curious about new pockets of traffic. What's a new pocket of traffic? Brick and mortar, international, apps, right? You have to be always looking for new pockets of traffic, which is why I put open brick and mortar there. Um, so I wanted to put a slide here with my information. Um, they're having me run out of here to do uh, an interview for the show, so I'm gonna be leaving, so I won't be able to talk to any of you guys, but um, find me on LinkedIn. I'm super easy to find on there. Um, although, the other, there's two more Charlie Coles. One guy won a gold medal in rowing. The other guy took the picture of the tank man in Tiananmen Square. So I'm probably like third. Um, but I, I would say, find me on LinkedIn. My email is C-C-O-L-E, so Charlie Cole, ccole at ftdi.com. Don't be a stranger, right? The reason I do this is because I believe in the community, I believe in networking, and if, uh, yeah, if you want to, reach out. That's it, thanks y'all.